All right. Good morning. He just said we're going to continue the series in the book of Acts. So we've got two challenges this morning, things a little different from what uh, maybe is normal. One is we're not in the book of Acts, but that's okay. That's okay. We're going to be talking about this morning how the folks in the book of Acts were able to do what they did. So that's still in the book of Acts, right? So we're going to talk this morning about hearing God. And a question that almost everybody has, and that is, how do I hear him? How do I know it's him? If we can't do that, we can't accomplish, we really can't learn anything else out of the book of Acts. Because if we're not hearing him, we're not going to accomplish very much at all. So that's one thing that's going to be a little different this morning. And the second thing is, how many of you actually end up in both services? You're, you stay through both services. I know a bunch of you do because you're serving. The rest of you are going to go, have to go back and listen to service number two afterwards to get the second part of the message. Because there's no way I can cover this topic in the time that I've got this morning, right? So rather than just hold you, we're going to split it in two parts. We're going to do it in service one, part one, service two, part two. I do have Pastor Matt's permission for that, just so you know. In fact, he suggested it, so it's all good. It's different, but it's all good. So let's start looking at this concept and this topic of how we hear from God. I've traveled all over the world teaching on a, a course from a, a ministry called Strings Ministries, and it, it was called The Art of Hearing God. And one of the things I learned out of that process is that hearing God is not a formula. Learning to hear his voice, learning to understand what he's saying to us, we can't sit down and apply logic to it. We can't put principles and say, if you follow point one, two, three, and four, you're going to hear what God has to say to you. Now, the problem is that most of us, particularly in our culture, we want a system. Give me a system. Show me something that works. Look, churches are not exempt from this. We all, you know, churches all over look at what works somewhere else. Show me the system of how you did it. Now come implement it in my church so we can be successful too. That's not just true of churches. It's true of us individually in our Christian life. We want someone to show us the system or the formula. And if you can give me a formula that I can replicate, now I can be successful in whatever it was we're doing. It just won't work for hearing Holy Spirit's voice. Hearing Holy Spirit is not scientific. It's not a formula. It truly is an art. It's creative. It's about listening with attentive ears and responding to what he says. Now, one of the things I could ask you this morning, and if we're honest, we all probably think this. Let's go ahead and tell you in advance it's a trick question. Do you ever ask yourself or say to yourself, if God would just talk out loud, if I could hear him like I'm hearing Michael's voice in the speakers this morning, if he would just talk that way, the world would be so much easier. So now my trick question, if God spoke out loud this morning in an audible voice, would everybody in this room hear him? Now, our initial thought to that question is to answer, of course. Anybody in here who can't hear me? Well, you won't be able to raise your hand to that one, will you? <clears throat> if you can't hear, right? So, it's kind of foolish, but everybody in here can hear me, right? So if God spoke out loud, surely everybody in the room would hear him. It's really not true. Because God speaking to us is not about what happens with these ears, it's not about what happens with these eyes. It's about spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection. It's about relationship. Now, we can learn about that out of a passage of Scripture found in John chapter 12. So we're going to spend our first service this morning, the first part of our message, focused on John chapter 12, verse 27 through 30, and we're going to see what we can glean from that passage. Now to set this up for you, Jesus has just entered Jerusalem and the people have been crying out to him, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Now, a few days later, they're not going to be so excited about him. But at this moment, everybody's excited about getting to spend some time with Jesus. But he begins to explain something to them that they truly don't understand. He is teaching them and speaking to them about the topic of the fact that he has to be lifted up. That he has to be glorified. Now, the people who are blessing his name at the moment, we could say they're all caught up in the praise and worship. Okay? Praise and worship is good, but we don't want it to hinder us from hearing. We want to be listening in the midst of our worship. But they're caught up in the praise and worship, and they hear him saying he has to be lifted up. Now, honestly, the Jews of that day were really excited because they thought he's going to become king, and we're going to get free from the Roman Empire. Let's bless him because he's going to set us free. It wasn't what he was saying. He was saying he was about to lay his life down. In the midst of that, with Jesus speaking, they're present in the flesh with a natural voice. With him speaking to a people who could literally hear his voice, they still weren't hearing everything he was saying to them. Now, that's one level of what's going on, but we can see it a little deeper as we move forward. Here's what happens as we get to verse 27. Now, my soul is troubled, Jesus is saying. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Now that's Jesus speaking. Then we have something interesting happen. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. The crowd stood there and heard it. And said that it was thunder. Others said an angel spoke to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice has come for your sake and not for mine. What are we going to learn out of this? The very first thing we get out of this passage is the fact that even if God spoke audibly in this room right now, everybody wouldn't hear him. Some of you wouldn't hear him anything. Some of you would hear a sound, but not know what he was saying. That's the thunder, right? Some of you might hear a voice, know what it said, but not be confident in who it was. That's the angel. And a few people would know exactly what he said. Now, it's easy to justify this passage if we're not careful by saying to ourselves, well, this was really to affirm Jesus. This was really for him. I mean, after all, he said, Father, glorify your name. And and the Father responded to him, I've glorified it, and I'm going to glorify it again. But that forgets verse 30. That forgets the fact that Jesus said something very important here. This voice has come for your sake and not mine. Who was supposed to hear the Father that day? Jesus? Yeah, he always heard him. But Jesus said, God wasn't speaking to me. He was speaking to all of you. And only a few people heard him. Now that's an issue for us. That's a concern for us. Why? Did some people hear him with absolute clarity, Jesus, and other people not hear him apparently at all? And then there's a whole range of things in between those two extremes. What was different about each person that caused them to receive the communication from God at different levels? That's really the question we want to answer today, isn't it? What level am I hearing him at now, and how can I improve it? I hope that's a question you want answered, because no matter how clear we're hearing him, we're probably still not hearing every word that proceeds from his mouth. We're probably not repeating everything he says and only that, and doing everything he does and only that, and that's how Jesus did it. Last time I checked... I'm supposed to look like Jesus, which means I've got a ways to go to improve, no matter how clear I hear him. 
Some of you are probably sitting in this room saying right now, well, I could have skipped today because this message doesn't even apply to me. I don't hear him at all. That's the camp you need to move out of. You can't exist in this created earth right now with all that's going on around us if you can't hear his voice. Matter of fact, I hurt, I grieve, not just for people who are unsaved. Oh, I grieve for the people who aren't born again. Don't you? I mean, do you, can you imagine living on this earth right now without knowing Jesus? But you know what? There's a second category of people I grieve for. That's the people who've received him as a savior but don't know what he sounds like. I can't imagine living on this earth today without knowing Jesus, but there's another step. I can't imagine not hearing his voice. I can't imagine not being able to receive his comfort. I can't imagine not knowing his direction, his wisdom to deal with life around me today. We, we're living in a rough time, if you didn't notice. It's not simple. We need him, and we need to hear from him. So how do we do it? Well, we have to look at Jesus as our example. If we look at the crowd that day, we had a diverse crowd. Some of them were caught up in their spiritual life, in their religious expressions, and not paying very careful attention. Some of them were right by his side, walking with him every day. Jesus, of course, was as close to the Father as it gets. And then there were even a group of people there, if you continue on in the passage, who weren't even sure he was Messiah. They were frustrated and grumbling about him. So we ran the gambit that day of the relationship of the people to their father. How did Jesus hear every word the father said? He spent all the time available to him in communion and communication with his father. How much time are you spending on that? We're really not asking the question of, can I hear God? We're asking the question of, Am I willing to take the time to hear God? There's a big difference between those two. I want you to understand we're going to come to it in just a minute, but you were created to hear him. You were created for communion and communication with him. You want to hear God? Very first step. Step one. I'll give you this one as a formula. Step one. Spend more time with him. Now you can say, Michael, that's... You're not giving me, you know, really concrete steps here. That one's very ethereal. We're spiritual beings. Spend more time with him. How do I do that? That's, I can't give you a formula for how you do it. Do it the way that works for you. How do you commune with him? If you can't figure out how you commune with your father, can I be bold enough to say, do you really have a relationship with him? If you can't figure out how to spend time with somebody, do you really know them? How many of you would say you're married this morning? You would say, well, I, I never even know if my wife's talking to me. And when somebody in the house does, I really don't know what she's saying. Well, the latter one might work, but... We don't do that. Why? Because we spend time with our spouse. We're in fellowship with them. That's what it takes to hear God. Now, we put up an easy excuse, and that is life is busy. How do you spend time with God? It's different for each of us. It really is. For some of us, it's to sit quietly in our prayer closet and just do nothing but listen. For some of us, it's to cry out to him and tell him where we are and what we're going through and what we're dealing with. For some of us, it's to get into his word and read and study and let life flow out of it. For others of us, it's in our acts of service as we work in our community, our neighborhood, our church, and we feel his presence around us. But for all of us, 
It's focusing our attention on who he is. In whatever way you do it. How much time are you taking focusing your attention on Jesus? And how much of your day is spent being busy with life? I hear a lot of response to that one, right? It's a tough question for us. You know you can do both. We can discipline ourselves to be near him in the midst of all the chaos around us. But it takes an intentional decision to do it. It takes us being willing to put the effort and the energy in to getting to know him more. There's another lesson we can glean out of John 12, and that's these four categories, these four stages in our journey to hearing. These four stages, we don't hear him at all. We, we hear him, we're just not sure if it's God. We hear something, we're not sure what he's saying, or we hear him clearly just like Jesus. Those are four steps in a journey. There's only one of those that's bad, folks. I'm good with being in any of three of those categories as long as I don't plant myself in the stage of I'm too busy to hear him at all. If you can stay out of that stage, you can grow. Bottom line, if you can stay out of that point of being too busy to listen at all, you can grow. Because he'll teach you how to know who he is, and he'll teach you how to discern what he's saying so that you can hear him just as clear as Jesus did if we're willing to listen. So what happens in this stage where we aren't listening at all? We have to recognize God is always speaking to his people. For some of us, we get into our mind that I'm not hearing him because he doesn't have anything to say to me. I know this is elemental, but let's be honest. We ask ourselves and these questions and we justify our lack of hearing with these answers. We get into a place where we say, well, God just didn't have anything to say to me. He's talking to the pastor. He's talking to the worship team. He's talking to the servants. He's talking to the staff. He's talking to the leadership. He's got lots of things to say to other people, but he doesn't have anything to say to me. You were created for fellowship with the Father. You were created to hear him just as clear as Jesus heard him. That's what we were created for. We can go all the way back to the book of Genesis and we can find out that we were created for communion and fellowship with God our Father. In the cool of the day, what's called the evening oblation. Oblation is a word that refers to sacrifice. So pre-fall, the sacrifice of praise offered to God was this, that Adam and Eve would stop everything else they were doing and God would step into the garden and spend time with them. That was their daily sacrifice, to just be still. Some of you are terrified God's going to call you to sacrifice and move to Africa for the rest of your life or something like that. That was the one when I was growing up. I don't know what you're thinking about now, but I was always terrified. God's going to God's gonna make me move to Africa. And he did. You know, I, mean, I, I end up spending weeks and weeks per year in Africa over the, a 20-year period. Why I was afraid of it in the first place, I'll never know. But we get that idea. I'm afraid he's going to ask me to do something I don't want to do. Well, the first thing he's asking you to do is be still and know that I'm God. Wait on me and see if I'll show up. Listen. And hear my voice. Let's have some time together. Is that a really big sacrifice? I mean, think about this for just a minute. The God of creation wants to stop what he's doing and spend the afternoon with you. I know these are silly statements, but think about this. If the president of the United States, like him or not, Maybe we're better off to say the Queen of England right now because we'd feel better about it. 
If a head of state calls up and says, I'm coming to your house tomorrow afternoon, I'd like to have some time to visit with you, would you clear your schedule to take the time to do it? We would. The God of creation asks that of you every day, and how much are we clearing our schedule to take the time with him? I want to hear you, God. I want to know what you're saying to me. I want your wisdom for the day. I need your help in my life. Do you? Do we really? Are we stopping long enough to get it? God actually came down in the garden in the cool of the day and talked with Adam and Eve every day. In fact, it was a big deal when they fell. Because Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. And because they were afraid, it was the same time of day they always, they were expecting to hear him. In the cool of the day, they knew his voice was going to come. They heard him walking. They heard him before he ever spoke. They heard him walking in the garden. They heard his footsteps approaching. And now, because of sin, you know what they did? Instead of sitting down to take time with him, they ran and hid. Can I challenge you this morning that that's why some of us don't hear? We don't think we're worthy to hear. We don't think we're deserving of hearing. We think our failure is so high that God would never climb over that to reach us. And I'm going to tell you, God pursued Adam and Eve in the garden despite their fall until he could speak to them again. And yes, he corrected them so he could have fellowship with them the rest of their life. Are we so afraid of being corrected that we would avoid ever hearing his voice at all? We are. That's our modern culture, our modern mindset. God is going to expose all my wrong and all my sin. If I actually hear him through others or even myself, then he's going to discipline me so bad, I never want to be involved with him again. That's how we think. How do I know it? Because it's been happening since Genesis. It hadn't stopped. You remember what happened when Moses went up onto the mountain to talk to God? The thunder and the lightning of the mountain, the very presence of God comes down for all of Israel to see and experience. And they said, yes, God, you're talking to us again. You better read Exodus if you think that's what they said. They said, no, God, don't do that anymore. Talk to Moses and leave us alone. That's what they said. We're still doing it. We're still doing that. We could have titled this message, Don't Fear to Hear. Because our fear is causing us to plant our life in the camp that says, I'm not listening, I'm afraid to hear, I don't want to know anything else. And then blame it on the devil or that God's not talking. Let me tell you a secret. If you're not hearing God right now, this day, if you're not experiencing knowing his voice speaking to you personally, it is not because he is not talking. It is because you're not listening. Now, I may be pretty bold in saying that, but I've got some good scriptural support to back it up. Please do not let me step on your toes without giving you a healing ball. Okay? If that steps on your toes, there is a solution. Stop being afraid. Stop being afraid of what he's going to say. Stop being afraid of what he might expose. Stop being afraid of how it's going to sound. Stop being afraid that he doesn't care. Stop being afraid you're going to get it wrong. And just listen. See... Here's our problem. We're in a distant place from God when we're afraid. Fear and faith are opposites. They're like the opposite poles on magnets. They repel each other. 
And if we're operating in fear, it's impossible to operate in faith. Now, the reverse is also true. If we'll operate in faith, it's impossible to truly be in fear. We can be a little worried. We can be nervous. We can be in awe. We can have a godly fear, but we can't work in a debilitating fear if we operate in faith. So when we walk in that place of fear that I might not hear or I might not get it right or he probably doesn't want to talk to me or I don't know how all this stuff works or nobody's ever taught about this stuff before or I'm Methodist, why would he speak to me? When we operate from that place, we are pulling away from God. We're backing up from him. Now, some of you have heard me give this illustration before, but, but let me just explain it to you this way. We get this idea as Christians that if I'm distant from God, it's his responsibility to shout so I can hear what he's saying. And God does not function that way. When we get distant from God, and Ross is off a ways right now. He's really not, but I'm going to use him for the illustration because he can take it. Ross is distant from God right now. So God doesn't shout, Ross, pay attention. That would kind of get our attention, right? He doesn't do that. What does God do? God says, Come here, Ross. Ross, come here. Come here, Ross. I know some of you in the back can't even hear what I said, right? Ross can barely hear what I said. Hey, Ross, come here. God doesn't shout when we're distant, He whispers. He said, Whoa. That didn't make any sense. If I'm far away, why would he whisper? It makes absolutely no sense for him to whisper when I'm distant because then I can't hear him. If I'm whispering to you and you finally perceive that I'm talking to you and trying to tell you something and you can't hear it, what are you going to do? You're going to come closer to hear better. So when God whispers, he's not testing us. He's not playing with us in some way. He's drawing us near to him so that we will hear more clearly. Here's the deal. If I shout at Ross or I shout at somebody in the back, you're going to stay right where you are because you can hear what I'm saying. But if I whisper, you're going to move so you can hear more clearly. So if you're waiting on God to speak audibly, to yell to you, you're going to be waiting a long time. You're going to be waiting till he comes back. You're going to be waiting till you go home, one of the two, because he's not going to yell. He's going to keep whispering to draw you close. You want support for that? Book of James makes it really, really clear. James chapter 4, verse 8. Really straightforward. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You want to hear him? Draw near to him. You think you're not hearing him? He's probably whispering. After all, he wasn't in the whirlwind. He wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the earthquake. When Elijah was beating himself up, hidden in a cave, saying, Woe is me. I'm all alone. God, you've abandoned me. God came and whispered. You remember? It was his still, small voice that drew him back to him. Some of you are waiting on God to speak in some miraculous, supernatural way that you could never deny being him when he's whispering to you every day, let's talk. Let's spend some time together. Let's hang out. And we can't hear it. 
because our minds are so fixed on what he's supposed to sound like. Second stage in the journey of hearing him more clearly. Some said an angel had spoken. Now this is the group who they know they heard something, but they're not certain where it came from. Some of you are in that camp today. You say, well, I felt like, I thought, or it might have been God. But we don't have the confidence to say it was him, so we attribute it to other things. We attribute it to our imagination. We attribute it to something we heard somewhere. We attribute it to random thoughts. We attribute it to daydreaming. We attribute it to angels. At least that's what they did in the New Testament. I know I heard something, but I can't be sure who it came from. You know what our response to that is today for the most part? Nope, throw it out. Throw it out. I'm not sure if that was God, so let's just chunk it. Wrong response. If I'm not sure, I draw near to him to find out if it was him. I don't throw it out. I seek it out. I pursue trying to understand what it was he's saying. God may be speaking to you through so many different sources, sources, that are as direct and clear as they possibly could be, but if we're not willing to stop and ask ourselves, was it him I really heard, we'll lose all the benefit of it. As we begin to realize it takes more than just desire to hear God's voice, it's going to require us to come out of hiding, to come out of fear, and to spend time listening to him, and we're going to encounter that challenge that everybody encounters, how do I know it was him? I'm going to answer that in the second service. See, I, I got to hook you with something so you go back and listen to it, right? We're going to talk about that more in the second service, but I want you to hear what's going on here. When, when I was um, a good Southern Baptist, Nice little family, four boys, beautiful wife, deacon in the Southern Baptist Church. I went to hear a good Southern Baptist teacher. Got him. Anybody ever heard of Dr. Henry Blackerby? Okay, good Southern Baptist teacher. He teaches a course that's called Experiencing God. And in that course, he talks about some things. He says, this is a quote from it. He says, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. I think he was losing his Southern Baptist roots when he said that. Because I can, you know, I, I, I grew up Methodist. I became Southern Baptist. And then I just went weird, and I don't know what I am after that. But I can talk about the Southern Baptists because I were one. And I'm not sure they believe God speaks. And he was teaching a whole course on knowing that God speaks. Now, he chose some really simple, straightforward ways. But he was saying to the people, God speaks in all these ways. You may not realize it's him, but if you'll begin to acknowledge it might be him, you'll find out that some of it is. And I went to this class that he was teaching in a place called Ridgecrest, North Carolina. And I went with a good group of good Baptist church-going young adults, small families, right? There were eight of us in a big suburban. I'm driving. One of my best friends was in the back or in the seat beside me. His wife was in the far back next to my wife. And he had been finding out before we ever went to this conference that God spoke and that God had things for him and that God wanted to reveal himself to him and that God wanted him to be filled with the spirit and that amazingly that he wanted and got from God the gift of speaking in tongues. He was Baptist now. And he decides on the way to North Carolina, halfway there, mind you, 
to turn around and tell his wife in the very back seat, hey, I speak in tongues. Probably not the best decision. But it led to a great conversation. We ought to be sharing, this is just a little side note here, we ought to be sharing our spiritual experiences with our family, with our spouse. We should stay on the same page. If we really want to hear God, then we stay on the same page with our spouse, with our family, and we communicate with each other as well. But it led to this long conversation, because needless to say, she wasn't thrilled. And we talked about this principle. We walk into experiencing God in your marriage, a marriage conference. And Dr. Blackaby, we're late because we slowed down over that conversation. We're late walking in. And what do you think he's talking about in his very first session? It's important that we communicate our spiritual experiences with our spouse if we want to have a strong marriage. He talked about exactly what we had been talking about. Do you think we had a question about was that God? talking to us through him? Yeah, we asked that question. It was a really easy answer, but we asked the question. And it got worse that weekend because the more the weekend went on, the more we talked about, the more we would walk into sessions and he would repeat it back to us. I literally, it got so bad that we decided one day we would just test God. And we said, let's talk about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and see if he says anything about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. God wouldn't really be that interested in talking to us, would he? Walk into the session, and you guessed it, somewhere in the midst of that session, he has this conversation about how much he enjoys peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. (laughs) It taught me something. God wants to talk to us. If I'm just willing to ask, was it you, I might find out it was. Instead of saying, I don't know, and running away from it. That was a big weekend for me. That was the weekend I was called into ministry. And it came in a way I would never have expected. It came with God speaking to me in an audible voice. The very thing I said we don't search for, we don't long for, we don't look for, He happened to choose to do for me that day, but he did it in a really unique way. I was sitting at the end of this session, the end of the conference, about 1,200 people in this conference center, and Dr. Blackerby stops his message, and he says, we're going to stop right here because some of the people in this room are being called into full-time Christian service, and we're going to give a moment for God to just move in the room and let you hear what God is saying. Like that, in my heart, in my imagination, I heard these words, that's you. To which I boldly responded, you're crazy. Second time, in my spirit, just in my thoughts. Why? I didn't think that was God. I heard something, but it couldn't have been God because I ain't doing that. In my imagination, second time, in my thoughts, I hear, that's you. I said, no way. Third time, that's you. To which I said, It can't be me, God. I'm in the middle of my career. And through the loudspeaker, over the microphone, phone, I hear these words. Some of you are saying you can't do what God has called you to because you're in the middle of your career. (laughs) I have since gone back. I've heard the tape. It was Dr. Blackerby who spoke the words over the microphone. My question becomes, I ask myself, who was that speaking? Was it an angel? Was it Dr. Blackerby? Or was it the voice of God? For me, I'm standing here today. You figure out who it was talking to me. This is a big deal. 
Third group, we're going to move through these last two quick. See, I told you I couldn't get through this. We're going to move through these last two quick. The third group, we aren't sure what it is God's saying to us. We know he said something, but we don't know what it is. Some said it thundered. This is kind of like the metaphorical language of God, his picture language, his symbols, his signs, his parables when he talks to us. See, because the thunder was not just thunder. The thunder was the voice of God that the people didn't understand. How do I know that? God's voice has lots of sounds. Job 40 verse 9 says, Can you thunder with a voice like his? His voice sounds like thunder. In, in Hebrews 19, or 12, in Revelation 1, in Revelation 4, it says his voice sounds like trumpets. In Ezekiel, in Revelation, he has the sound of many waters. In Deuteronomy, he sounds like a raging fire. All those are metaphorical. All those are symbolic. But if we ask him to interpret what he said in those sounds, he will you may not know exactly what he's saying. You may need some help to understand what he's saying. But all we have to really do is ask him. See, this is where God plays hide and seek with us, like little children. He gives us instructions and hides them, waiting on us to go look for them, to understand them. And if we kick back and just say, I don't understand, we'll never get what he's offering. Support for that one? Proverbs 25, 2. It's the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search them out. We're kings and priests, folks. When you say, I'm not sure what he was saying, what you're really saying, it's time to play hide and seek. I get the glory of searching out the understanding of what he was saying. That's approaching it with faith instead of fear. Or I could tell you stories, but we got one more step to take. And that is the last step in the journey. I want to hear just like Jesus did. I want to hear with absolute clarity. I want to know what he said, that it was him saying it and exactly what he meant. That's the place we ought to be longing for. I can't say we're all going to walk in it every day. In fact, I'm going to suggest to you that most of us believe we can never get there. Not most of you believe we can never get there. Most of us believe we can never get there. See, somehow we think the pastor can hear clear, but I can't. Do you know most leaders who we think of as hearing with great clarity experience the same worries and challenges and fears over hearing that everyone else does? It's the nature of being human. Each of us were created with ears to hear, but they're spiritual ears. And they have to be trained to hear his voice. In all its forms, from Metaphors of dreams and visions and images to the mysteries of parables and dark speech and riddles. By the way, if you don't know dark speech and riddles or a way God speaks, check out Numbers 12 and Proverbs 1. To the subtlety of his still small voice, impressions, redeemed imagination, and the unreserved nature of his audible voice. Visitations, translations, supernatural experiences. The ways we hear from God are as multiplied and varied as there are colors of green when you go outside and look at the landscape. But every way he speaks has a few things in common. And we can count on them. We can't be afraid to hear or be willing to listen. We have to intentionally spend more time with him so that we learn his voice. And then, something we haven't mentioned yet at all, 
but it's so important. We have to value what we hear and respond to it. That's Matthew 13, 12, if you didn't know. He can talk to you all day, but if you don't respond with obedience, his voice is going to grow quieter and quieter and quieter. Matthew 13, 12, for the one who has, values, puts to use, responds to, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But the one who has not, doesn't value, ignores, stops paying attention to, even what he has will be taken away. Those are our foundational principles. How do I hear God? Am I willing to pay the price? Father, in the name of Jesus, teach us to be willing. Teach us to pay the price. Teach us to be a people who long to hear. Help us grow. Open our ears. Let us learn to fear you more than we fear failure, you more than we fear mistakes, you more than we fear misunderstanding, you more than anything, so that we pursue listening, understanding, and obeying. Teach us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand up. Ministry team's going to come. They're going to be available to you for a whole lot of things. The offering baskets are going to come by. You can put your gift in there, put the little contact cards in. The reason it works that way is not to disrupt you from the main focus of what this moment is for. And that is to make a commitment to respond did you hear God today? I don't know. It may have just been my voice. But maybe something in there touched your heart from the Father and not just from me. Maybe he sparked something in you to pursue listening to him. If that's the case, make a decision. I'm going to suggest something to you. If that's the case, do something about it today. It may be to come forward and just ask somebody to pray with you. It may be to come forward and say, hey, do you have a word of encouragement for me so I can know that I'm hearing? Hey, could you pray for me because I need to know he's moving on my behalf? I may have some sort of need or whatever it may be. I may need to say today, I don't even know him. And I need to. That may be one way you need to respond. Another way you may need to respond is to go home and find your secret place, your quiet place. And can I ask you just to take five minutes to be still today and see if he really wants to speak to you? Now, that's an undisturbed five minutes, which might take you four hours to get to. So just be quiet, to put aside distractions. Just be still for five minutes. I promise you, if you value five minutes, he'll give you more. That's our responses today. We're going to worship. We're going to release you. We're going to invite you to come for ministry. We're going to give you a chance to give and to share your requests and your needs. And then I'm going to ask you to go forth and respond. Lord, stir us up, carry us forth to expand the kingdom and to grow in ourselves to know you more. In Jesus' name, amen.